George, how are you? I'm doing well, my friend. Very good. good Listen, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I've been really looking forward to speaking to you. So uh, it's generally, or, or it's genuinely an honor to have you on. Uh, for those of you who don't know who George is, George is a Cuban member who was one of the founding members of the Medellin cartel. And at one point, you were one of the biggest drug traffickers in the United States. That was in the 70s and 80s. And you've had dealings with some pretty big drug dealers in the history of the narcotics business, including, I suppose, Pablo Escobar, which many consider as the biggest, right? Yeah. Well, it's interesting. So I, I'll tell you this. Well, two things. Great to be on your show. Thank you. Uh, I only decided to do your show. I, I'm not doing any more podcasts. I had decided not to do any more. Uh, but I love Ireland and I love Irish whiskey, so I just couldn't help myself. Thank and, you so uh, much. And actually, actually, we were headed to Ireland this year. We went to Scotland two years ago because yeah. my son was a golfer. And my daughter was going to get married in an Irish castle. Thank God yeah. she broke a boyfriend, so I didn't have that bill. <laughs> but but uh, And Rory McIlroy is one of my favorite golfers in the world. So There you go. <laughs> I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I could not help myself. Good, But, good. Uh, yeah, it's an honor to be with you. You know, uh, I, I'm just going to give you highlights on my life. Uh, there are more detail in two books I wrote. The first one, Coming Clean, yeah. uh, which uh, now I just released on uh, Amazon, the 20th anniversary edition. It was a bestseller in 98. And I did tell, you know, my message, uh, I came from, from a very, very poor family. I mean, very wealthy family in Cuba, but we lost, lost everything coming to yeah. the U.S. Yeah. And I had to go to work at the age of 10. And, you know, my mother was very religious and my father was not. My father was not that he was anti-religion. He just, you know, typical man, Catholic of the 50s, 40s. Yeah. You know, very private about his religion. Yeah. And not her. You know, God was everything. So we come to the United States to be with God. She gets left behind. <laughs> my dad begins to uh, have to clean. He was uh, one of the wealthiest men in Cuba. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's cleaning toilets at a department store. Uh, for barely enough to eat. And wow. uh, I mean, all I had for, for lunch, I mean, for breakfast was two raw eggs and this pot of milk that were not mixed. Sure, sure. But, you know, we grew up with tremendous principles. Sorry, Go George, ahead. just one question. One, one question I was going to ask you there. Like, obviously, as you said there, that you were, you were like very wealthy in Cuba. Why did you end up deciding or why did your family end up deciding to move to Miami then? Because my mother uh, refused for her children to grow up in a communist uh, sure. regime. Okay, especially gotcha. one that said that, like I, saw it, like I said, she's very religious. So one yeah. that said there's no God, and for her, God was everything. Sure. So she's like, uh, to the point that she was willing to give it all up yeah. to come okay. to the United States. A woman that was, her father was one of the biggest uh, figures in Cuba. And, uh, you know, my mother, I, I tell people, my mother was born with a silver spoon. I mean, my mother had an apartment in New York City when she was 20 years old. Wow. So, uh, very wealthy, came and to pick tomatoes in the tomato fields. Yeah. That's what yeah. she was willing to do so her children would be able to come to a country to worship God freely and not be on the communist regime. Yeah, it's That's funny because, because, because I've, spent, I've spent a lot of time over in Miami and pretty much every person from Cuba that I've met all kind of speaks the same thing about kind of, I suppose, the Castro regime and everyone, obviously everyone who's there were people who, who got out during that. And I mean, like there seems to be a lot of, a lot of dislike for, I suppose, the Cuban regime in from Cubans that are living in the US. Yeah. And, and it's interesting. I mean, I, I didn't go back to Cuba till my mother died. Wow. I mean, I, I couldn't even go uh, to Cuba and visit. I wanted to go back to Cuba because I wanted to see where I was born. Yeah. You know, yeah. We're, we're, when you look at it, we're the only uh, race in history to be in exile 60 years. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, because uh, Castro turned it into a total communist di dictatorship and, uh, and everybody lost everything. And, you know, and the people were uh, hurt a lot. And yeah. uh, so my mother, like every typical Cuban in Miami, uh, would have nothing to do. I mean, they looked at Castro like the devil. Yeah. So yeah. I was too young. So I, didn't, I did not feel that. All I could uh, tell about that was from my parents. Yeah. But seeing your suffering and seeing how they came to the United States and willing to leave everything, yeah. leave a life of luxury to come to the United States and, and, 
literally go hungry. It's uh, it, it had to be a very very compelling reason for them. Yeah. And, but the, the good thing about the the uh, people in Miami, if you live there, is and you see what's going on in the world with the Black Lives Matters movement and yeah. and 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 police and all of that stuff. You know, hey, I, I'm a considered a person of color in the U.S. Right? Because yeah, I'm a yeah. I'm a Hispanic. Sure. But so not to say that we ever went through or suffer the uh, racism that the African Americans did sure. and, and all that they went through. I mean, we went through our own kind. I mean, when you have, when you're 10 years old, you get off the uh, airport and you see this lady looking at you and say, go back to Cuba, spit, yeah. calling yeah. us old names and Miami is not. And we literally in school, we would be punished if we spoke Spanish. Sure, I know. You, know, yeah. you wonder like, what is this all about? But the thing with the Cuban people is, we never saw ourselves as a victim, yeah. you know, and we just united strong. Yeah. We worked very hard and, uh, and we took over Miami. Yeah. What, 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 what year, what, what year did you actually move to Miami, George? 1966. 66. October 11, 1966. Okay. Okay. So you would have been, you would have been there during like, like you would have been, you you would have been, you would have been there for all of the growth of Miami and all 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 of all of the craziness that went on. I suppose in the seventies and eighties. Then, well, Miami, I literally, it was us that built yeah. Miami. Yeah. Miami was a city built upon drugs. If anybody yeah, knows, yeah. they're lying to you. I mean, yeah. Miami was just an old city for old <laughs> Jewish people used to go die. Yeah. Miami, Miami people was dead, and uh, Miami was built with drug money. I yeah. mean, they said that. During my period of time, which was my, uh, 77, 78, there was more money in the Federal Reserve Bank of Miami than there was in any Federal Reserve Bank in the United States. I saw that. That's crazy. It's, like, uh, it's for, for, like, like suddenly turns into this economic powerhouse and it's oh, all built from When you think about it, drugs, that we were right? doing generating in 1976, $100 million a month. That's crazy. I mean, we're, they, we were producing more than the number one Fortune 500 company. Yeah, that's so, incredible. It was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, one thing, one thing that I remember reading about you, George, was this. I mean, you grew up and you were quite, you were, you were, you were quite anti-alcohol and you were anti-drugs and that. How did you actually get into the narcotics trade? Well, I was, I was, and I am. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, you know, my my father had tremendous principle, right? Yeah. So he was like, hey, work hard, sacrifice. And, and get an education or you will become somebody. Yeah. So I've been getting up at 4.30 since I was 10 years old. Yeah. Because I had to help my family eat. Yeah. So at 17, I've never, I never broken the law, never had a traffic ticket because I had a vision for my life. Sure. My life was I would graduate from University of Miami at 20. I would graduate from law school by 24 and I'd be a millionaire by 30. Yeah. Because my, my game plan was until I become a millionaire, I'm a nobody, and I don't yeah. want to be a nobody. Yeah. So I went to school full time at University, uh, at University of Miami while working full time for the Federal Reserve Bank. Yeah. At the age of 17, I was the youngest employee in the federal government. Yeah. And, uh, and I was an honor student, and I would not, uh, by the age of 20, all the alcohol I drank in my life did not fit into a little teacup. <laughs> no way. I never smoked in my life, never did drugs. Uh, and it's interesting that the original group. Because I'll, re I'll, I'll reveal this, and I did it in another uh, podcast. There was no Medellin drug cartel. Yeah. That was a fabrication by the U.S. government, right? Okay. The original group from where you would say the Medellin cartel surfaced was this group that I was part of. So I was, I said people, I was a founding member of a group that became known as the Medellin drug cartel. Because what happened from this original four people and me that controlled all the drug trade in America in the uh, 70s, yeah. came, then surfaced the Pablo Escobar, the Ochoas. And yeah. I said that, and people thought I was crazy when I said it, until recently, one of the Ochoa brothers said the same identical thing. Really? I don't know if he copied it from me in a really? podcast, but he said, hey, there was no Medellin cartel. Why? Because as opposed to now, where you had the Sinaloa cartel with El Chapo, yeah. and where there was one boss, yeah. back then in Medellin, there was five groups. Sure, sure. Six groups, I mean, five major groups. And each worked individually. Now, we worked together in something, but everybody had their own infrastructure. Sure. There's another revelation. Pablo Escobar was by no means the biggest or the wealthiest. 
Yeah. By no means. Maybe half as wealthy and half. Now, what he was was the most murderer. Yeah. He was the deadliest. He was ruthless. Violent. Yeah, very ruthless. Uh, if Pablo killed you, he would kill every male in your family. The big guys, no one ever knew. Yeah, yeah. And it was good for them because when Pablo started to take all the, all the fame because of the extradition, they were like, hey, good, let them. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. But, you know, there was, there was the gacha that people know of probably was twice as wealthy as Pablo. Sure. And, uh, but Pablo got all the publicity. Sure, sure. And it was good for the Americans to, to find one person. Sure, yeah, yeah. How does a Cuban end up getting mixed up with the, the, the Colombian drug cartels? How did that come about, George? Because that's the other thing. Without the Cubans in the 70s, first with marijuana <clears throat> and then with the cocaine, yeah. there would have been no distribution. We control all the distribution. I started because when I was graduated, my accounting professor asked me if I would go work for him. Uh, yeah. He'd give me a secretary office if I did the Spanish clients. He did not speak English in Miami. I live in Miami, you know, if you don't speak English, you're in trouble. Yeah, I'm in yeah. Spanish, you're in trouble. Yeah, so he yeah. asked me <clears throat> and I went to work for him. And the first client I went to do was a little grocery store. Yeah. And I would go in there on Monday and think about it. This time I'm making $4 an hour working for the government, which was a huge salary when minimum wage was like a dollar fifty. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden I go in there and I see hundred and twenty five thousand dollars the first yeah. time. Yeah. And I, but I was so naive that I didn't think nothing about it at that time. Yeah. We could go back also to the 70s where cocaine was not even in the drug enforcement radar. Sure. Because it was something for the rich and famous, for the Hollywood celebrity. I mean you can buy a gorgeous four bedroom home in Miami for twenty thousand dollars when a kilo of cocaine was $70,000. So who could afford that, right? Wow. So <clears throat> these people went like that. And, uh, and I didn't think about it. Next week I come and there's 85,000. Now I start getting a little suspicious. Yeah. When I came the third week and there was another hundred grand, I'm like, I called the owner. I'm like, hey, let me give you a basic formula here. Yeah. Here's how it works. If you buy $100 and you trip, you sell it for three times the, the price, you sell it for three hundred dollars, so yeah, two hundred dollars is your profit. I've deposited over three hundred thousand dollars this month. That means you should have at least a hundred thousand dollars in purchase goods. Yeah, but all you got is like seven hundred bucks. I mean, like, <laughs> what again? And they looked at me and they laughed and they're like, "Hey, listen, we're not drug dealers. I mean, we're not in the grocery business. We're drug dealers." I'm no, like, and they were that upfront about it. I mean, straight out like that. So I tell people, wow, I mean, I went into shock for about 10 seconds, really, <laughs> because I was able to justify how we justify everything in life, right? Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was, hey, you know, I'm an accountant. There's no money laundering laws. As long as I don't break the law, I'm okay. Yeah. And uh, they asked me to open foreign bank accounts, and I began to open foreign bank accounts for them because I knew how to do that in the government. I started making a lot of money. Yeah. And then one thing led to the other. And then they approached me and they're like, listen, we want you to handle all our operations in the U.S. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Wow. I mean, I hadn't even seen what cocaine looked like. I'm like, yeah. yeah. The and then hell? suddenly, and then suddenly you're from? working with the big boys. Who am I going to sell this? What the hell do I do with the money? How do I get it to the customer? Yeah. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, it's all about mindset. It's a recent book I wrote uh, called Narco Mindset Journal. Everybody asked me, yeah. why don't you have any fear during this virus? How did you overcome prison, tortures, build a multi-million dollar uh, company, get a PhD? And I said, it's all about the mindset. You know, it's about how I look at the world. I don't know what the word I can't means. Yeah. In my dictionary is how can I? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, what is there to fear? I can't live a life with fear, you know? Yeah. And uh, if someone's done it, I can do it also. Sure. I might have to work four times as hard, but I can do it. Gotcha. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and so things like that. So, you know, as I detail in the book, then one thing led to the other. Before you know, in six months, I was U.S. head of all, all operations. And in 1976, when I took over, they were bringing about 100 kilos uh, a month, which was a lot, a lot back then. You know, you talk about $7 million. 
in retail. And yeah. uh, the following year, we're bringing 600 to 1,000. Yeah. And there were times when we're bringing 800 three times in one week. Yeah, yeah. So I was 21 years old. I was making a million, two million dollars a month. And I was uh, dating the most beautiful women in the world. I lived in mansions. I had a fleet of air uh, jets. Yeah. I had yachts, million dollars worth of cars. Dated uh, the prettiest supermodels. But I was miserable. Yeah. I couldn't understand. I reached my dream. Yeah. I finally got to the summit. And there's nothing here in the summit. Yeah. You know, I'm still the same empty human being. Worst why was that, George? Huh? What, 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 why, why was that they, 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 you felt so empty? Because, you know, society tells us today the American dream. Yeah. The American dream doesn't exist in how society portrays it, right? Yeah. We're constantly inundated with commercials. If you have this, you will be happy. If you have this, if it's a car, if it's this woman, if it's this gorgeous supermodel, if you have this beautiful home and people end up getting into debt or people sacrifice everything to get that, and it's just not there. I believe for me, and it's important for your listener, I believe we're all born with a hole inside of our body, our soul. And I believe that that hole can only be filled for me, for me, for George Valdez. I'm not saying this for anybody else. Sure. Is by a relationship with my creator. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I was arrested in Panama. Uh, I crashed over the jungles of Panama and uh, I was tortured for 28 days, day and night. Yeah. When I was, for five years, I ended up going to a bathroom and, and passing blood. Yeah. I was brought to the United States and charged with heading the largest drug conspiracy in the world yeah. in 1979. And I was given the highest, bond. when a bond was $100 to $1,000, I was given a $7 million bond. And I was just 23 years old. I didn't even have a traffic ticket. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I didn't know that one of my attorneys had betrayed me and he was telling everything to the government about me because I, I've been to prison twice. Yeah. Never, never has there been a gram of drugs. Never has there been a picture with somebody compromising. Never has been a wiretap, nothing. Always on a conspiracy charge. So it's, so it's all been done by people going behind your back who you who 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 had inside knowledge on you and feeding something. And some of these people could be compromised themselves in terms that they might no, need they a deal. Right. That's what happened with my attorney. He got arrested for bribing judges. Yeah. And uh, and he said, "Hey, I have a bigger fish than me." Yeah, yeah. And that was me. I I didn't even find out for five years. Yeah, yeah. I it got was you. crazy. Yeah, well, like, well, well, one of the things that strikes me about you, George, is, I mean, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have have seen the documentaries Cocaine Cowboys, and obviously you're seeing this extreme violence in there. It's obviously based on, on Griselda Blanco, and it, 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 like she's she strikes me as the direct opposite to you. She strikes me as completely, I mean, she seems vicious. You strike me as you're very well-spoken, you're educated and that kind of thing. But you guys would have been in Miami and you would have been involved in the same business at the same time, I would have thought. No. Have, have, you, have you ever had any dealings with her? Or, or like, no. like uh, what was Miami like during the 70s and the 80s? Okay. So not at all. When okay. we started, the first group that started was business people. They were yeah. family people, very religious. Okay. The uh, violence with Pablo and Griselda came in the 80s. Okay. Right? And she was very violent. Okay. She was very, very violent. And she, uh, but I had no dealings with her at all. Because sure. I went to prison in 79, 84 when the violence really, really took over. But... Okay. So two things about what you just mentioned. One, remember, every story that's out there, is like Narcos, for example. People ask me, how, how real is Narcos, right? Yeah, yeah. I say, well, remember, if you're talking about the Medellin drug cartel, there's only probably five people alive that really, really know. Everybody in the world now works for the Medellin cartel. Everybody, yeah. right? You see it in yeah. Narcos, you see it in Cocaine Cowboy and all that. You know, fine, it makes them feel good. The people that really did, there's very few alive that were in that inner circle, less than a handful, yeah. and they're not talking. Yeah. So what well, you see portrayed, a lot of it is entertainment, right? Sure. Now, sometime this year, 
follow that studio, Cocaine Cowboys, because they're coming out with their last Cocaine Cowboy episode. And I'm going to be in all, all the episodes. Yeah. And it was interesting because they asked me a question that goes a little bit hand in hand with, with what you just said. So they asked me, and it's never been asked before. So they said to me, why was it that it was so easy for you to walk away? Because so I come out of prison, I went back to the same thing. I was angry at the government. Yeah. I wanted to get even. You know, I felt like, hey, I'm I I was arrested in Panama, brought to the United States, sent to Macon, Georgia, where I never have been in my life. You know, all this railroaded. I want to get even. But then I realized the world had changed. It had become violent. Now kids were getting hurt. And in 1987, I walked away. Yeah. I couldn't take it anymore. Even yeah. to a point where I thought I was going to get killed within a, a month. Yeah. So I walked away and I was retired for four months. And until they come and got me because they had a task force following me because they couldn't stand it that I had retired with all that money. Yeah. So basically at the end, they come up with another case and uh, which was literally a violation of my parole. And I forfeit everything I had, went back to prison for another five years. Yeah. So yeah. they asked me, why was it so easy for you to walk away and, and so difficult for guys like Pablo El Chapo or one of the subjects of this cocaine cowboy style Magluda when they had tons of passports, yeah. tons of money, and couldn't tons walk of away. planes. They all, hey, listen, in a minute, they could get in a jet yeah. and go to a non extraditing country. Yeah. Robert Vesco, very few people know about Robert Vesco, was the first Ponzi uh, deal in the United States. Yeah. He, he, he robbed them a bunch of millions of dollars and went to Cuba and just yeah. died a couple of years ago. Really? Lived there all his life with no problem. <laughs> yeah. Lived like a millionaire that he was. Yeah. Why was it so easy for you and difficult for them? And yeah. I had never been asked that. And it's interesting because it just came to my mind, just answered it. I said, because I never saw myself as a drug dealer. I saw myself as a businessman. I had numerous companies. I had orange groves, cattle ranches, construction company. I said, I had numerous company. And to me, cocaine was just another product, another company that I had. And when I realized that that product that I was selling now was hurting people, I just quit and yeah. I went with my other company. Yeah, yeah. But for El Chapo, for Pablo, for Sa, all the people, their only identity is a drug dealer. Yeah. So for them to leave that behind and go live, you know, in Lululand, retired, a millionaire, quiet for the rest of life is impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's nearly it's, addictive. It's nearly addictive. What they're doing is nearly addictive because it's not just like it, like they're addicted to the power that they have and and, and I suppose the not notoriety and that kind of thing as well. Surely, you just said it. When people ask me, "Do you miss your life?" <clears throat> I'm like, "Okay, do I miss getting on my jet whenever I felt like going?" Yeah. Versus flying coach <laughs> with two people a lot heavier than me and me in the middle. Hell yeah, I miss it. Yeah, Do yeah. Do I miss back then when I was young having any woman I wanted? Of course. But I wouldn't change that for the pain that it cost and the emptiness that it brought me. Yeah. But yeah, the okay. hardest thing for me to give up, the hardest thing was not even making all that money. Because I'll tell you a story. One day, my housekeeper says to me, I had a couch that was angled in the back of my office. And she said, can you, can you move? I was sitting in the couch. Look at some papers. He said, can you move so I can clean behind the couch? We, I haven't cleaned there in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, sure. I moved yeah. it for her. And there was a bag with $700,000 there. Whew. I had no idea. This is 1978. Yeah. I had no idea who, who dropped it, who it belonged to. And that's no, crazy. That's seven hundred. That's that's seven hundred thousand dollars in the 70s when that's oh, like in today's four, worth, that's today. millions, you know? At least four or five million today. Oh, my God. So... <laughs> It wasn't the money because after you have so much money, but it was the power. Yeah, the most yeah. insidious of all drugs is power. Yeah. Ask yeah. yourself why some politicians sell, I mean, risk all the money, wealth, and comfort they have to become a president. Yeah, yeah. Or to run for political office. Take, take our president today. Yeah. Why would he want to abandon? His house made the White House look like an outhouse. 
Yeah, yeah. Jet was nicer than Air Force One. He had everything. Why give all that up for half the world to hate you? Yeah, yeah. Right? No, I agree. I agree. That power, man. It's and no, it was I get it. for me. You know, because no one did, I mean, in the old days, people didn't think about doing me wrong because they knew I had so much power I could wipe them out in a yeah, second. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. people now people do whatever the hell they want to do. And then nothing I can do. It, 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 it's, it's funny because as well, like it, one of the things you mentioned there was Narcos, the series. And there was uh, t- two things that obviously you hear all these conspiracy theory, uh, theories. And one of, one of them actually, I, I was reading something there the other day about the murder of Kiki Camarena. And that, that, that was actually, they were saying, now you don't know how true these things are granted, but they were saying that there was links between the CIA and or the K- Kiki Camarena had found out that the CIA were in bed with the Mexican cartels, and then basically he knew too much. So they were saying that there was CIA involvement in that. And then you've also heard, obviously, they're saying that the CIA or the DEA, whatever, killed Pablo Escobar, but then you hear other theories as well. So you don't really know what well, to believe. Well, I know, so literally, I walked away right before the whole deal with Kiki Cameron. Our group was the first group to bring a lot of cocaine to Mexico. Sure. So Kiki Cameron, I don't, that's not true with the CIA. I, that, you know, all people see the CIA. Look, how would I say this? The CIA runs a lot of uh, operation that there's no congressional budget for. So where yeah. does the money come from? So speculate, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't dealt much with the CIA. Yeah. The, the agents that I, and I'm sure there's great people in there. The agents I dealt with were the scum that I knew were the scum of the earth. Really? No education. I mean, horrific. Yeah. One of them, uh, you know, uh, Monkey Morales got murdered in Miami. Yeah. So as opposed to all the FBI and DEA I dealt with, they were all very educated, very professional. Yeah. I mean, as a whole, right? You got someone bad everywhere. Yeah, of like course. I tell yeah. people, look, there's bad people at the grocery store, and I still go there every day. Sure, yeah. So, yeah. so that's the thing. With Pablo Escobar, I can tell you this for a fact. Yeah. Okay. The version of Narcos is a lie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, his son said something, and 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 the truth lies a little bit of between Narco and what his son said. His son said that Pablo shot himself. Now, I don't know if he did or not, but I do know because he told me many times that he was not going to be brought to the United States walking. Yeah. I do know that he committed suicide. Now, did he commit suicide by shooting himself or did he commit suicide by putting himself in a position, which he did, so that they would find him and kill him? Yeah. Yeah. So Pablo... Pablo, as much as a murderer and all that, you know, I hear his son, it breaks my heart because people ask his son stupid question, right? Of course, his father was a murderer, horrific person, but I'm sure without a doubt that he loved his family tremendously. Yeah, yeah. And he loved his children tremendously. Of course. Right? Yeah. And yeah. that's that's it. That's human nature. Yeah. So yeah. when they ask the son, you know, all this stuff, of course, he's going to say, hey, I, you know, my father was a gangster. I know he did all this, but I was too little to know that then. All I know is that he was very loving to us. Yeah, yeah. So he knew that when he killed those two guys, two brothers, not brothers, but kids that he had grown up with in yeah. prison, uh, he knew that it was over with, right? Yeah. That they were going to get him. And it wasn't the feds or the DA or no one. I mean, the way Pablo had it, and where he was, there was no way in the world they would have gotten him, ever. He'd get in a taxi with 10, 15 cell phones, talk for two and a half minutes. And in that town where he built the schools, and I mean, he, look, all the schools that he built and all the houses, yeah, he took the initiative, he took the credit, but all of us paid. Sure, <laughs> you know, yeah, every yeah. Every one of us was taxed. Yeah, yeah. So, I know, anyway. I get you. Like, like uh, one, thing, one thing that you touched on there you do, it was obviously the time when you had the plane crashing in the Panama jungle. I, I, am, am I right in saying that that plane had 200 kilos of cocaine on it? Yeah, it had 200 kilos of cocaine, and it had, uh, it had ether, 
Yeah. You know, and it had a bladder because that's how we would add extra distance to an airplane. Okay. A bladder okay. is like a rubber, like yeah, a, to make it, a yeah, rubber balloon. For extra fuel. Exactly. You fill it up with fuel. That's why we crashed because both alternators went out and we couldn't get the fuel from inside the, the airplane to the wind tank. Oh my God. So we ran out of fuel at 5,000 feet. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And I mean, and I should have, I should have, like, like the, the head of the pilots, the guy I had hired to uh, transport the cocaine, uh, he said, hey, blow it up. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to blow it up. There's, you know, there's $7 million, I mean, $12 million in there. Yeah. And uh, he's like, hey, take the flare gun and blow it up. You'll make that again. But my ego was to a point that I felt indestructible, right? I felt yeah. like I was God. Nothing could happen to me. I mean, we were right next to the border of Costa Rica. Yeah. We have paid a million dollars to get the president of Costa Rica elected. So yeah. we knew that we could get it transported to the border very easily. Okay. So I thought nothing was going to happen. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, unfortunately, it did. Yeah. You know? And, 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 and when you were in Panama, it was Noriega, wasn't it? Who was in charge of Panama at the time, General Noriega. And you had some rather unpleasant experiences for, for the, you, you, were, you, you were only there, what, a month, a month and a half, was it? A month. Actually, Noriega was actually pretty nice to me. Really? What happened was, so we crash land, right? If you saw pictures in my book, the plane is dives. So yeah. there's no way you can put a ladder. You have to put a ladder to be able to go inside and check it. Yeah. But when they found the drugs, uh, and, and so what happened is I gave the commander that came around, I gave him $100. You know, I yeah. kept, I always kept $20,000 in the hidden compartment. And when he came around, I, gave, I should have, I should have said, hey, I got drugs in there. Help me to hide them. And here's $10,000. I mean, he would have hit the airplane yeah. <laughs> by himself. But I didn't. It was stupid of me. And uh, so I said, hey, here's my passport. Can you stamp them? to show that we came in here legally. Yeah. And he said, sure. And, uh, and when he sent uh, my name to Panama City, they're like, stop him. He's the biggest drug dealer in the world today. Yeah, yeah. So we come back the next morning, because I had called Costa Rica, I had someone coming to pick up the drugs. And, uh, <clears throat> and we come to, uh, next morning I see the DEA, the Consul General, and I'm like, oh man, the crap hit the fan. Yeah. But I knew that I could bribe my way out of Latin America. Yeah. So when the attorney general came the next day, he's like, uh, I said, look, don't waste my time, and I'm not going to waste your time. Tell me how much money to buy the Coke back and how much money to leave the country. Yeah. And he's like, Noriega already sold the Coke, but $250,000 for your leave, which yeah. is like a million, million and a half today. Yeah. So I said, okay, no problem. So we had, a, I always had a contingency plan, right? So we always had a million dollars cash, not 250, a million dollars cash in, in a place with someone with a phone 24 hours a day that if he was given a code, a certain code with certain numbers, he knew exactly how much money he had to deliver cash the next day where. Yeah, yeah. So when he came, I said, fine. Here's the code, call this person, and you have the money here in 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, he does. So the mistake that I made, though, was I should have not said nothing to the pilots. Yeah. Because I said to a pilot, hey, they told us they're going to take us to the city of Panama, hang in there, they're going to rough us up a little bit, but we're leaving to Costa Rica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we went to the city of Panama, and they took us in a room, and it was empty, no furniture four chairs, and all of a sudden they bring this little white kid, uh, 45 kilos maybe, you know, small, yeah. skinny. They threw, handcuffed to his feet and hand, and they threw him in the floor, and they stuck a broomstick up his anus. Oh, Jesus. And blood just splattered all over the place. <laughs> yeah. And they looked at us, and they said, <laughs> we caught him with five pounds of marijuana. <laughs> Fuck. Now we got 200 kilos of cocaine. Yeah, yeah. So the pilots, I mean, they were like huge, man, a meter eight something. They're like, they cracked. They started singing. <laughs> so not only did they tell the DEA who was watching, hey, this guy's the biggest drug dealer in the world, but he just bribed your attorney general. Yeah. So I mean, like now, you know, we're, we're, the guy that could get me out, 
So they threw us in a dungeon <clears throat> and torture us day and night. Uh, to the point I bled for five years. I mean, they put electricity to my testicles. Uh, they would come in two, three times a day. I mean, there was blood all over the place, no food, no nothing. Jesus. And then when I was, when I was about to lose it, and, and my fear was that I would lose my, my mind yeah. in there. Because yeah. I'm looking at this guy across the cells from me, and we're in a dungeon, like a 15th century old prison, 16th century. Filthy, I'd say, was it? No light, no nothing, man. Yeah, yeah. You're like you're seeing Men of La Mancha. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and this guy licking the bars. You know, been there three months. Jesus. And uh, he had lost it. And I'm like, no, I got to get these people to kill me. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to talk. And I just, I don't give a damn. Yeah. So I thought when they came that time, before they started beating, I said, look, I want you to know something right now. Tell Noriega, he needs to kill me. Because yeah. if he doesn't kill me, he knows I got the power that when I get out, I'm going to find him, find his family. I'm going to have his family rape in front of him, and then I'm going to kill them all. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, definitely, that's enough to trigger it. And he came the next day and actually came laughing. Really? And he's like, why are you threatening me? You paid the wrong man. I didn't tell on you. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, I said, well, how much? He's like, Another 250,000, damn, is that the only number these freaking people know? <laughs> you know, before I'm paying 250,000 for four, now I'm paying 250,000 for two, give me a break. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we did, I paid it and uh, he did, next day he took us to uh, at the airport, but instead of sending us to Costa Rica, he had told Interpol. Yeah. And while we're waiting for the plane to Costa Rica, Interpol came, grabbed us and threw us on an airplane to Miami. Okay, okay. And w w w when, you got to, when you got back to Miami then, were you, were you arrested when you got back to Miami? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, immediately. They were waiting for us. I mean, it was, it was the biggest drug case in the history of America at that time. Yeah. Uh, well, but, yeah. But, I, but you see, it's, one, thing, one thing that I didn't really understand about that was, obviously, there was no crime committed in America there. So why, like, why would you be serving any... Like, and and if, if my knowledge is correct... Uh, Nor Noriega had taken the cocaine and sold it. So why were you like, wh where they was the They didn't even have any coke. They didn't have anything, right? Yeah. Except those two parts. Because in the United States, and this is what Pablo Escobar fought. I don't know in Ireland, but I think the United States is the only country in the world that has this law called conspiracy. Okay. So in the United States, if you and I talk about, and, and I said today, hey, brother, let's bring in an airplane with cocaine. And you yeah. say, great. And we take one step. All we say, like, you say, I have a pilot. Let me call him. And you call him. Yeah. That's enough for us to be charged. Back then, 15 years. Today, a life sentence. No way. You can go to jail. Oh, well, they charge me. So you can go to jail without any crime being committed. None. So what they, and that's what I fought it because in my trial, I, I had the biggest drug lawyers in, in the world. A million yeah. dollars of defense. Yeah. In my trial, my defense was, yes, I am a drug dealer. Okay. I said, I'm a drug dealer, but, but first of all, so first of all, they, they tried to indict me. I stayed six months on what's called a sworn complaint, no indictment. Yeah, yeah. And they tried to indict me in the Southern District of Florida, the middle and Northern. Yeah. And none of them would indict me because there was no crime in Florida. Wow. But then in Macon, Georgia, which I've never been in my life, the guy that was with me had a case pending from six years ago. I just met him three weeks earlier. Yeah. And they tied me to him. Yeah. So my defense was, listen, my client is a drug dealer. Yeah. But my client's got a constitutional right to what's called venue. If you want to charge my client, you need to charge him in Miami. Yeah. You can't charge him in making, he's never been to making in his life. Yeah. Because they say that at a, at a little uh, restaurant in Miami, uh, I mean, it was so such a joke that they would not... <laughs> The grand jury would not even indict me. They yeah. said, yeah, in this little restaurant, the Foreign Ambassador's uh, cafeteria, which is probably like two and a half meters by four meters, I pulled out this big map of Bolivia, and yeah. I said to the pilot, this is where we're going to go pick up these drugs. Yeah. Literally. That was enough for them. Again, no wiretap, no pictures, no drugs, nothing. No money, nothing. Sounds, and, like, uh, it sounds like a very easy way to go down. It sounds so, like so Pablo Pablo said, listen, you cannot charge me in the United States yeah. for conspiracy because that's not a law in my country. Yeah. 
Yeah. So extradition law says you got to, I can only be extradited for a crime that's a crime in my country. Sure, yeah, yeah. And that's what he was fighting. Gotcha, yeah, yeah. I mean, rightfully so. Yeah, and, and, and you, 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 end, you ended up getting sentenced to 15 years, wasn't it? 15 years, but in, in 1979, if you didn't have a record, if you've never uh, had any felonies, mm. the most you would do is one third of your sentence. Yeah, yeah. So you served so, what, four and a half, five I, years? So I served five years, yeah. and then I had 10 years parole. Okay. So when I got arrested again, that they wanted my money, what I was charged with was, was violating that parole. Okay, okay. You know, because I came clean. In that case, I could have won that case easily because even the only witness that they had the night before, killed himself. He was yeah. smuggling. He was smuggling cocaine in an airplane that belonged to a DEA. Oh God! And it was foggy, and he crashed. And uh, but you know, I had I had turned my life around, and I was tired. Yeah. So when I meet my attorney, I had no clue why am I why am I arrested? I haven't done nothing in four years. Yeah. And uh, when I meet my attorney, he's like, "Don't worry, you're gonna walk out of here." And I'm really. And he's like, they got nothing against you. The only, uh, uh, it was 165 people indictment. Yeah, the trial yeah. was ended. Everybody got, that got convicted, got convicted. The only guy I knew, which was the guy I had hired years ago to, that, I, that was in prison with me. And, I, and when we got out, I hired him to bring in loads for me. He got convicted. He's not testifying. He had life. So yeah. one of the pilots said, this is, this is, this was in them. The pilot said that he took my friend to Miami. Yeah. I picked him up at the airport. And then later on at night, my friend came back with a suitcase with, I forgot, three, seven million dollars and went to a pilot and said, look how much money George Valdez gave me. Yeah. Now, anyone that's in the business knows that you don't talk to, nobody talks to pilots at that level, that that's all BS. Yeah. But, and then that guy, that pilot killed himself. So, yeah, yeah. but for me was, I was tired of fighting, man. Yeah. And I had become a Christian yeah. and I felt like, you know, when I became a Christian, I didn't believe God was real. I didn't believe God existed. Yeah. I did. I had a guy witness to me for three years. And uh, I just like, I see this guy that's so happy that has nothing. Yeah. And here I'm living in this freaking, I had moved to my uh, ranch. I had a $20 million ranch. And uh, I'm living the life of a multimillionaire. And I'm miserable. And this guy's teaching me karate. And he's got nothing. He lives in a little hundred square foot home yeah. and he like super happy married to the same woman 25 years madly in love with her i'm going out and going to bed with supermodels and i hate them all yeah. and i'm like what the <laughs> heck man this guy's gotta be on some type of a drug or something yeah but for three years three yeah. years man he walked that talk yeah and uh i, I never forget it was july 1st 1990 my divorce was final yeah and my little daughter which was the apple of my eyes yeah She's, my, my ex-wife is dragging her away and she's crying for me. And I went into my room and I remember that, that talk. I call it prayer now, but I got on my knees and I said, I said, God, first and foremost, I want to tell you, I don't believe you exist. Yeah, <laughs> I was an atheist. Yeah. Yeah. I said, look, you know, I'm an atheist. <laughs> Number one, <laughs> if by some miracle you do exist, I know you're looking at me and say, yo, you're so bad. And we don't, I don't want you up here. Stay down yeah. there. But if you're real, change me or kill me. Yeah. Because if you don't change me, I'm going to spend the rest of my life telling the world what a fake you are. Yeah. But I want what that guy has. My money can buy anything. His money cannot buy nothing. And I can buy it. Yeah. I want that peace. I want that joy. I want that content that he has. Yeah, yeah. And man, my life went from hell to worse hell. <laughs> Three months later, I get picked up and I get arrested. Oh no! And uh, I never done anything wrong. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm looking at a, a life sentence yeah. because even though when I committed the crime, the most they could give me is 15 years. Yeah. And in my case, 10 for violation of parole, because he continued. My partner Dicky, yeah. because he continued, it's called continued criminal enterprise, which means that you are everybody in that enterprise is charged with the highest crime committed in the enterprise even if you're not involved still nothing that's crazy 
Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, pretty crazy loss. But uh, so I'm looking at facing five life sentences. Uh, number one, a life sentence conspiracy to import when nothing was imported. Yeah. Conspiracy to possess what was going to be imported. Mm -hmm. Conspiracy to distribute what was going to be possessed, what was going to be imported. That's the United States law. Yeah. Three yeah. life sentences for the same crime. Yeah. So I look at my attorney and a Jewish guy, and he's like, if you plead guilty, they're going to crucify you. Yeah. I'm like, Alan, here's the problem. Here you are, a good Jew, telling me I'm going home. <laughs> and I've decided to follow this other Jew that ain't said nothing to me, man. Yeah. And, uh, but I know this thing. If my life is going to change, I got to come clean. I can't go on. Now, I know I could not hurt anyone because that's the limit thing. I run out on everybody. Yeah. I said, I got to give them what they want. And, and basically what they wanted was all my money. Yeah. You know, they had a, and they weren't going to leave you alone till they got that. Right. And I told him, I said, I, I've been fighting these people since I'm 20 years old. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm done, man. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, but if you do, you have a chance to spend the rest of your life in jail. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. said, but if this Jewish carpenter I decided to follow doesn't <laughs> change my heart, I'm dead anyway. I don't give a shit where I die. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, I went back to prison. I got the, the 10 years, which is the, the parole. So I served five. And in prison, I got a master's degree in theology. I wanted to learn about God. And I got a master's degree in theology. I, when I got out, I got a PhD. I became one of five Hispanics in the country with a PhD in, in theology and ethics. Yeah. Then my dad died, and I'm missing him a lot. And I realized he never gave me nothing but his time. Yeah. So I had four children from a prior marriage living yeah. in Georgia and I was living in Chicago. Yeah. And I'm like, how much do they remember me? As someone who sent a check every month and had a good summer. So I left that. I abandoned my teaching career, which was my passion, my love. Yeah. And I started a little cleaning company in the basement of our house. Yeah. And in 12 years, I built it into a multi-million dollar national international company. Wow. Then I retired one day. Decided to be a, a dad to my last two little kids. Move the family to Mexico yeah. so I can make them breakfast, so I can go to the little league games and just be a dad, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, because I tell people, look, in life, if, if, if you cannot define when enough is enough, then the only motivator that's going to drive you is greed. Yeah. And if yeah. greed is what drives you, you'll never be happy. Yeah, yeah. So... But one of the one of one of the things that I like, and I always notice this, George. And like, look, you're a prime example of it because look, you're undoubtedly super intelligent. You're a very very smart and educated guy. But you often see, and, and I, I I think this is kind of said a lot. You often see guys like Pablo Escobar, El Chapo Guzman, a lot of these guys. Like, if these guys had gone into business in something which was legal, these guys would probably have made it, a lot of them, as legitimate businessmen and, and, and being multi, multi-millionaires anyway. Yeah, no doubt. You know, people used to say to me in prison, oh, you made all this money because you're in the drug business. I said, really? I'm in prison with over a thousand men dead broke and I'm a millionaire. Yeah. So yeah. it's not easy money. No. It could be no. fast money, but when you think about every other competitor wants to kill you, yeah, it's a Every very government risky agency game. wants to put you behind bar. Yeah. Everybody wants to betray you. And you wake up and everybody's following you. And it's easy? Yeah. I don't think so, man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's no wreck. Agreed, agreed. You've got to be like you've got to be like you're ev you're evading, you're evading people who you you don't know who to trust, who are also involved in the game and then you're also obviously you're looking out for all types of law enforcement in different countries, different jurisdictions, different types of law enforcement. So, I mean, you've got to be, you've got to be lucky all the time. You've be, got to be on your game all the time, it seems. Yeah. So, and it's you a know, dangerous it's game. something very interesting that you said about what they, Pablo and El Chapo could have been. And it's something that I'm dealing here with in America with the massive incarceration, you know, yeah. and the war on drugs. It's the biggest joke in the world. Agreed. It's the most corrupt entity in the world. Uh, they don't want to rehabilitate anyone. They want a warehouse man so that they can make money off them. And I say this to people, I said, especially let's talk about what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement and the young kids. Yeah. I said, you got all these kids in prison 
doing a life sentence that is so unjust because the laws were created in, in 87. When I walked away, the laws were created to go after people of color in America, especially African Americans. And uh, when you think about it, in 79, I was in prison and whites were 80% of the population. And now, between if you combine Latino and blacks, we're almost 92% of the population. Yeah, it's crazy. And, uh, and we're only 4% of the world's population, yet we have 24% of every incarcerated human being in the world. Yeah. But yeah. I say, you take these young kids that you're locking up, that grew up in a, in a place where they had no chance in life, and you're locking them up for life because let's say that they stole the bike when they were 10, yeah. and then they got caught with a joint when they were 14, and all of a sudden now they sold 5 grams or 10 grams of crack, and they're three times looser, and you're giving them life at the age of 20, uh, 18, 17, I said, and you're making them into animals. Because yeah. number one, you don't want, the ones that have a chance to go home, you want to make sure they come back. If exactly. you think about in the next 10 years, eight out of 10 black men in America will go to jail. Yeah. Think about that. Well, 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 well funnily, funnily enough that you, you, you're saying that because I was listening and it has to do with the Black Lives Matter uh, thing where I was listening, Denzel Washington, the actor, was asked about it. And he grew up in, in somewhere in New York, I believe, and basically two of his best friends are, one of them's in jail for 25 years, one of them went to jail for 15 years, I believe. And he was asked about it and he said, look, undoubtedly, like, uh, black people are starting from a disadvantage and we know that and we accept that. But he said, a big, the big difference between me getting to where I am and my two best friends is that I grew up in a home with a father, whereas the other two guys grew up in fatherless homes. Why? And that connects with the point that you just made, George, because you're locking these men up in, in, in their 20s and then they've got kids on the outside and they grow up in fatherless homes and then same problem, right? I just had an interview today and I said the same thing. I said, look, if you really, why I think the Black Lives Matter movement is dangerous is not that the movement is dangerous. Yeah, there's bad people in every movement, right? And, and there's a lot of legitimate people, good people that want to see good outcomes out of this. It's dangerous is because they're putting the focus in the wrong thing. And number one, let's be real. If, you, if, if people don't like you, I don't give a damn how much you march, they don't want to like you. Yeah. So yeah. the old generation in America is not going to like African-American, Latinos, or immigrants, period. Yeah. That's just the way it is. Yeah. You can't change that. Yeah. I said, but where we have to start is we have to go back and rebuild those communities. Because that child, without a father, and the mother, if the mother is not a crackhead, she's got to work like crazy to feed her children. Yeah. So who, who raises that kid? The yeah. gangs. Now, I did gang revivals, all right? I don't talk out of theory. I talk about what, what I know. I did gang revivals in Chicago. And I can tell you this. I'm a person of color in America, yeah. right? Because I'm a Cuban. Yeah, yeah. I've been racially profiled many times in America as a little kid on. But I've never felt unsafe in a white community in America. Yeah, yeah. As I do in a Latino community or African-American community. Sure. When I used to do gang revival, my, my thing was this. And I told both the, the African-American and the Latino, why the hell are you guys killing each other? Not yeah. blacks against Latino. Latinos killing Latinos and blacks killing yeah. blacks. Yeah, yeah. I said, so therefore, if we, if, if then I go to a guy like Denzel Washington, right? Yeah. And so many of them, because no doubt, look, one of the things we need to teach in our schools is the history of the suffering of the black men and women in America so that this new generation that is still impressionable will grow up with a different outlook and realize, man, these people have been lynched. These people have been at a disadvantage. These people have been uh, discriminated horrifically. They have, not, they have been sent to the wrong community. On and on and on. Yeah. Okay. But I tell Denzel Washington, Denzel, and, and the many black entertainment, because there's a lot of wealth yeah, in the African-American yeah. community. Of course. Who has most of the wealth in the uh, sports industry? African-Americans. Of course, yeah, yeah. Entertainment, rappers. Yeah. I, I would say to Denzel Washington, 
why the hell the minute you made it, you left. Yeah. And you moved to the community of the people that supposed to be oppressing you. Yeah, yeah. And why yeah. didn't you look back? Now, I'm not saying then self percent. I don't know what he's done or not, but I know a lot of them don't. Yeah. But I know a guy like LeBron James who built a school, whether it was his money or friends' money, whoever, but built a school for disenfranchised kids and their parents. And look at that school. That school is outperforming every other school in Ohio. Yeah, yeah. And if, if we don't educate those kids, what happens? An uneducated population is a controllable population. It, it, I can tell you in prison, nine out of 10 men that came to prison could not read or write, African-American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what, like one know. thing, and you've probably seen it this week as well, which now, uh, admittedly, I've only, I've only read snippets of it, so... I may be ignorant to some of the facts, but from what I saw, I was kind of a little bit confused, but I saw the, the former boxer, Paulie Malinaggi, he, he was fired from his job with Showtime for making some comments, which, I, I mean, the bits that I was shown, I didn't see anything racist in, in, in terms of what he said. And, no, and that's horrific, man. That's, yeah. that's another thing that needs to be stopped. Now, I, I'm a self-made man, okay? Yeah. I live in a, a, a gorgeous mansion, and I drive a Rolls Royce. So... Yeah. All with my money, my sacrifice, my hard work. So I don't give a damn what people think of me. Yeah. It doesn't affect me. You know, I'm already uh, retired. But I worry about my kids who are professionals and coming yeah. up in a world that they better be like a robot because yeah, if they say think. something, what it, the heck, man? Yeah, Listen, yeah. if I don't like a black man and I say it, it's my right. That's why I live in America. Yeah. If I don't like a white man and say I need to I can I should be able to say that. Well, I, now, I, 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 I think that I think that one of the things that was kind of and I, 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 I was looking at something else today. One of the things that was being pointed out was like let's say for instance if there's an African American boxer and if he makes a, a, a racial a, a racial comment about a white guy or or a rapper makes a racial comment about a white guy and, and, and it's a racist comment that if he does that, there's like, okay, well, we just ignore that and we, we move on. But then when it's done, and I, I, look, as I'm saying, from what I saw, and I may be wrong, there may have been something, and you've got to be careful in terms of what you say now, but from what I saw, I didn't see anything racist in terms of what Paul, Paulie Malinaggi said. So, I mean, trying to silence people over, over like, for, like I don't know, as you said, pe people kind of need to be robots now, you know? Yeah, look. I believe in freedom of speech and I believe in respectable. I don't believe that we should have freedom of speech to demean people, to insult people, to call gays faggot or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, or to call the N word to a black person. Yeah. I don't believe we should do that, but we should have a, a, we should have the ability to be able to say, Hey, I don't like the black lives matter uh, movement. And you know what? I, I, I believe all lives matter. Yeah. Because yeah. to me, to me, I understand what they're saying. Okay. Again, by no means do I try to compare my pain to their pain, right? Yeah. Cubans were not lynched. Cubans yeah. were not thrown in segregated communities on and on, but we suffer our own form of, uh, you know, racism, whatever it is, yeah. but racism has been around since the creation of humanity. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What we need to do as a movement is number one, I ask this, first of all, you see uh, Colin Kaepernick, when he kneeled, he yeah. kneeled respectively. I didn't yeah. see, well, yeah, some African-American athletes defended him, but yeah. nobody came to his help. Yeah. Now everybody, white people, everybody, it's okay to kneel. Well, if I don't want to kneel, that's my right. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's also my right if I want to kneel. Yeah. I'm yeah. not racist because I don't kneel. No, exactly. And you I'm see not this, racist, this thing. you know, and I don't disrespect the flag because I kneel. We left Cuba so we could do this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but but now we're becoming, you know, we're becoming a, a robotic. Everybody's offended about everything. You've got to do Everybody's this. So You've got to do this. Exactly. For, 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 for me, I think that, look, I, I, I think everyone should be respectful of each other. If somebody if somebody's using a, raci a racist term or something like that, look, I don't think that's acceptable. And I don't think it's acceptable no matter who does it. But I don't think that, like... I think that if somebody says, I think now we're in, a, we're in a culture, George, where if you say something that somebody doesn't agree with or somebody doesn't like, 
you mightn't have done something which is racist or you mightn't have done something which is, it, 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 it mightn't be wrong, but then, I mean, you can get cancelled, you can get fired for that. And it's like, come on. Look, it's like when the Me Too movement happened. I have three daughters and a wife. Yeah. I want them to have respect. Of course. I want them to be. But I'll tell you this. You remember when Mike Tyson went to prison yeah. for technically raping her? Whether he raped her or not, my question is, what is a Bible school teacher that she's saying, doing, okay, doing, going to Mike Tyson's room at 3 o'clock in the morning to yeah, teach him agreed. about Jesus? I agree. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what happened. As a result of that, every time I had sex with a woman, I had to film it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. To protect myself. And you know how many times filming it saved my ass? Three times. Really? I had three different women because all they need to do is go to the hospital and, or, or the police station. If they have your semen, boom, you're dead. It's your yeah, word against yeah. them. That's, exactly. that's wrong. Yeah. You know, no, of course need, it's wrong. Yeah. We need to respect people. I fight. Listen, I'm not African-American, and I fight for African-American. I built the only Catholic church in a prison that is predominantly black, Angola. Yeah. When mine are never going home. Yeah, yeah. Some of my closest friends are black. Yeah. But yeah. I'll be damned. If you don't like what I say, don't talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. you can't crucify me. Yeah. Yeah. And Unless, and look, 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 I think, if, I think, I, and I, we, we, we'll move on after this, but I think if, if, if people are saying, I suppose, something which is a racist comment, and if you're being, if 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 you're being provocative and if you're if 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 you're looking to like obviously with people going look you can say uh, like the, the KKK having rallies and whatever look I suppose I suppose when they have rallies and that it is wrong but I suppose it is within the whole American freedom of speech and whatever but I suppose even giving them any kind of attention I think that's stupid as well and, and just because they're like those people are idiots. And if yeah. they're going and if they're like, if they're, they're shouting racism from rooftops and whatever, just ignore them or whatever. But I like, I, I, exactly. I don't know. Like, yeah. Listen, I don't know. It's tough. Us Cuban, we never felt a victim. Uh, many African Americans rightfully feel a victim because they have, but at the end of the day, those that have made a need to help and we need to number one, fight those, that the prison reform, those uh, criminal justice laws that affect and killing that community. Then we need to fight for the, for the African-American community to have better schools for those yeah. kids. And yeah. then instead of giving them $600 to stay home and do nothing, give them $600 so they can get an education. Why? Because there is a lot of good people in the African-American community 100%. that want to get an education but cannot because they have to feed their family. George, George, me, what, what I think the solution there is, and I think it's the same with the Native American community, is those two communities in particular should get free education uh free third level education so basically that like let's say if you're grown up in the bronx you're grown up in harlem or somewhere now and it, let's say let's say you're coming from a family with with little or no money and you're there going well look like why stay in school i don't have i, I don't have the prospects of going to university or whatever so Let's, I mean, those people are, they are starting at a big disadvantage. So yeah, give them free, give them free third level education. And, and give don't, them the money. Don't do it at the expense of other people who would be in university, have them in there as well. Exactly. And the thing is, give them the money so that they can eat. So they don't have to choose between having to work so they can eat and not be able to get an education. Yeah. Provide an education. And, and those in prison, rehabilitate them. Look what they're doing in LA in a prison where they're teaching them coding. Yeah, you know, yeah. What are those guys saying in that prison? We'll never go back. Hey, I was in jail when they were rehabilitating people. Nobody that leaves prison wants to go to the prison. Wow, Come back. Yeah. I'm gonna tell you this, me. Take me for example. If I left prison as a twice convicted drug dealer, yeah. and nobody would hire me, I couldn't get a job. I could, a society discriminated against me, and I had no way to make a living. You know what I was gonna do? I was gonna go back to Miami, smuggle drugs. Yeah. That's what I know how to do. That's the thing. It's a cycle. It's a vicious family. cycle. Exactly. Yeah. Thank God I was able to get an education. Yeah. I was able to get respect. And I was able to better myself and reinvent myself. Yeah. But a lot of these kids don't have that ability. I and got you. no child, every children born, black, white, red, blue, whatever color, every child born, God looks at them and said, it is good. Yeah. Society makes them bad. Yeah. And, no. and, and, and there's no reason why every child, yeah they, yeah, they talk about even in the playing field. That's good. 
But what yeah. good is the play field? What good is to give equal opportunity to every African American if the kids are not prepared to compete? Yeah, yeah, no, they have the intelligence. My God, we had a black president. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That came from a poor family. Yeah, we have, uh, uh, you know, some of the most brilliant uh, academic minds. Our history shows us George Washington Carver, you know, a slave, yeah. uh, became one of the greatest scientists in America. Yeah, yeah, they've suffered and they're going to continue to suffer, but we must fight to give yeah. them a chance from birth. Exactly. That's what we got to do. Agreed, agreed. I suppose uh, going back to, I suppose, the narcotics industry, I know I touched on Griselda Blanco a little bit earlier on. Something else that I always thought, obviously, uh, like the per se, like y you saw one thing in, in, in Cocaine Cowboys when she was obviously portrayed as a very big time player. I don't know how accurate that is. You're going to know more than me on that. But say the likes of herself and somebody like Pablo Escobar, would they have been kind of, would they have been partners or would they have been in competition with each other? Or how, how did that work, George? Okay, so let's put it this way. The minute she went back to Colombia, she got they killed. killed her immediately. Yeah, yeah. She was as ruthless as Pablo was. She was big in, in New York. Not yeah. as big as they said. that. She, like, again, the biggest people in the drug world, nobody knows about. Yeah, they were yeah. not out there flashing it in the people's face. Yeah. Now, she was big. I didn't know her, so I cannot say anything sure. about it. I, all I know is the comments from those that knew her. And, uh, you know, was she big? Yeah, she was big in the States. Yeah, uh, yeah. Was she in the, uh, the demand in the United States is so much. Think about it. The United States consumes, what, 90% of the world's production narcotics? Yeah, yeah. So the demand was so much that there was enough room for Pablo, uh, Ochoa, uh, El, uh, not El Chapo, uh, Gacha, yeah. and Frank Jimenez. Us, so yeah. there was enormous demand. Yeah, yeah. So there was not one group that that control. I got you. Okay, anything okay. like that. Fair in the beginning, <laughs> in the beginning, it was that group yeah. that I represented. Yeah. That group controlled ninety-five percent of all the cocaine. And then, and then I suppose once the demand grew, I suppose it's the same as anything else. You're going to get other people getting involved, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, so uh, Pablo Escobar, which is obviously a household name. And he's somebody, that, like everybody around the world knows who Pablo Escobar, like El Chapo Guzman, everyone knows who they are. Like, I know that you had dealings with Pablo Escobar. Like, how in contact with Pablo Escobar were you? Have you met him face to face? Like, what kind of dealings oh, yeah. did you have with him? Well, I had a lot. Of, I mean, I brought in a lot of loads with them. Okay. Because one of the things that I, that I always did, and actually I learned it from my the way I ran my businesses and is this, I always believe that every employee is going to uh, get a bonus. The question is, are you going to give it to them or they're going to take it? Yeah. So for example, in my organization, I'm paying my employees $5,000 a week back in 1977. That's a lot of money. That's like 30,000 now. Yeah. But they're collecting $80 million for us. Yeah. 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 Right? And they know I'm making a million. Sooner or later, human greed will come in and say, Hey, it's ridiculous, right? Yeah. So yeah. At, at the end of the month, I had a profit sharing. You know, hey, I, we made this much, and I give him an extra bonus, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a piece. They were super happy. Yeah. So it was maybe one hundred fifty thousand dollars less for me, two hundred thousand. It didn't matter, but I didn't have to worry about them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what the what happened was when when Pablo and them surfaced, I decided that if I'm going to bring in a load of let's say six hundred kilo, right, yeah. half of the load will belong. To my partners and I, yeah, three hundred, and then the other three hundred kilos, I would divide it a hundred for Pablo, a hundred for Gacha, and a hundred for another guy. Yeah, so I would bring in enough for everybody so that because one of the things about Pablo, man, he was extremely jealous. I mean, yeah. he killed this one guy, Frankie Menes, only over the fact that uh, at a party the guy said, "Hey, Pablo's got all the fame, but I got all the money." Yeah, and he killed him. Pablo killed him and killed his whole family. Yeah, yeah. So. What, what, so wasn't there what so, what, what, wasn't wasn't there something where 
like trust was obviously something you've seen this in some movies like blow or you've seen a lot of the ones where he features and trust was something which was very important to Pablo Escobar. And I remember hearing a story uh, where he actually rang you and he said, listen, George, something about uh, uh, charging people an insurance fee for bringing in loads into the States. What was that? So I always told my employees from day one, Nobody dies for telling the truth. Yeah. Nobody dies. Don't ever lie about nothing, no matter how painful the truth is. So one of the, as we're going, I, I say, we're, we brought in quite a few loads. Never lost one ever. I, uh, he called me up and said, hey, we're going to charge insurance. And I was like perplexed. So we were charging Seven thousand dollars a kilo because even when he brought a hundred kilos of his, yeah, it yeah. wasn't all his. Yeah. He get his friends. He let a friend bring ten, another five, and then he would charge him freight. Yeah, and then you know make some of his come out for free. His yeah. freight, yeah, that we call right. At that time, transportation was between five and seven thousand dollars a kilo. Yeah. So he said, "I'm going to start selling insurance for ten thousand dollars a kilo." Yeah. And I said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he says, "Well." So let's say that we lose a load and someone gave me 50 kilos, but pay me the insurance, which is 10,000 total instead of seven. Then what I do is I return the cocaine back to them here. So they lose nothing but time. And I'm like, why would we want to do that? We've never lost a load. And he's like, because every third load, I'm going to say that we lost one. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, because number one, they're not going to lose anything. But number two, then I'm going to have all the cocaine in Miami. Yeah. At that time, cocaine in Colombia was $2,000 a kilo. Yeah, when yeah. we started, it was 18000 to 21000 Sure. Now, in, in 1986, it was $2,000 a kilo. Yeah. He said, I'm going to have those kilos in Miami at 2000 And all I got to do is give it to them here. So I ended up bringing all this load with their cocaine, literally, yeah. right? Yeah. So... I, I looked at him, I'm like, Pablo, I'm sorry, I, I can't participate in that. Yeah. And he was shocked. And I said, why? I said, because it's a lie. If I lie with you against somebody, what happens one day when somebody comes and gives you a lie about me and you're going to believe it? Yeah. Man, and I'm going to tell you, brother, it was prophetic. Yeah. Prophetic. Yeah. Because I get a call one day from this guy who's the hitman. Yeah, yeah. Now, thank God I knew him. Victor was the guy's name. I knew him very, very well because he worked for that guy that Pablo killed. Yeah. Okay? And I did him a lot of favor when they killed his boss. So he says, I have a contract on you. I was sent here by Pablo to kill you. Yeah. And I'm like, what? He says, he says I, I came because I have so much respect for you and I know there's some mistake. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, long story, we called Pablo. And what happened was that someone, I had brought, I was bringing in a load to Juarez, Mexico, and there was an operation going on in Juarez. So the pilots shifted the load to outside of Houston, right? Yeah. Well, it happened to be a farm that Pablo owned and he was preparing to use it, right? Mm -hmm. Because whenever you buy a farm, you put a strip, you don't bring your load immediately. You start bringing airplanes from, you know, from, from Mexico, from other part of Latin America so that people get used to it yeah, before yeah. you bring in that. And when that guy got caught, he said that I authorized him to use it. Yeah. I didn't even know the guy. I didn't even know that that a strip belonged to Pablo. Okay. So they, we, they put him on the phone and I'm like, first and foremost, you know that, that I don't lie. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Number two, I did not know that was your strip. Number three, Think about it. If I had known it was, I would have asked you for it. And you would have given it to me because yeah, yeah. I give you mine. Yeah. And he's like, sorry, and hung up the phone. Yeah. And that was the end of it. Yeah. But had I participated in a lie with him. Then he's going to think you're a liar. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Uh, and it, like, I suppose another thing that I always were, uh, that, that I always, I suppose, wondered is, Obviously, you were working at the top of the game, at the top of the drugs game, I suppose, in the US, which is the top of the world's drugs game, George. So I suppose 
at the peak of your time, it would have also probably been around the peak of, say, for instance, the five families, the Italian mafia. And like they would have been, obviously, like they say, a lot of them tried to say that they weren't dealing in the narcotics trade, which I think is pretty much known to be bullshit. But in terms of would, would the cartels, like the Colombian cartels, would they be dealing directly with the likes of, obviously, like a local mafia, like the New York Five Families, and, and, and mafias like the Russian mafia? Like, what, what, what would the relationship be like there? Okay, so when I, when, when I started, when I went to prison, I don't know what happened. I, I've heard some old mafia figures talk about how they were involved in narcotics heavily. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that to be true or not. I know during my time, we didn't deal with them at all. Okay. Zero. Our clients were mostly people in Miami were Cubans. Yeah. Okay. In, in LA was Americans that were tied into the uh, uh, entertainment industry. Okay. You know, and that was our two biggest market. Now, some of our people in Miami sold to New York, California, but I don't know if they sold to any, any big mafia boss or anything like that. Yeah. I know one time I was asked by one yeah. to trade him cocaine for heroin okay. because they did control the heroin trade in the sixties and, and so that early on. Sure. And, and I refused. I said, look, I don't get it. I, I respect what you do, yeah. yeah. but I don't get involved in a crime that kills children. Yeah. 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 I Hopefully. was 21, 22 and yeah. I walked away. Uh, you know, whether they respected what I said or not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I know I, we had no fear of them. I yeah. know that they, they had a lot of assassins, but I make a phone call and I have a thousand in Colombia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would have thought that everybody. the cartels are bigger. Because than... the thing with the cartel, the thing with the uh, American mafia, yeah. and I have a lot of respect because some of my closest friends in prison were like big in, in the mob, Italian. And okay. Italians and Cubans have always gone along very very well yeah yeah and, uh, and i have tremendous respect i love italy yeah and and i have respect for everybody sure but one of the things with them is that we knew who who they all were right yeah you know the houses you know where they live who they yeah. are nobody knew who we were yeah 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 if i if i if i make a phone call and we have 500 trigger men they don't know where we are yeah yeah i i can go to colombia yeah. and have 500 colombians that no one knew yeah. Killing every Italian that walked around. Now, yeah. I'm not saying we were more powerful than them or not. You know, I had a lot of respect for them. Yeah. And, uh, and I respect the, those that are now talking publicly about it in their life. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I had no dealings at all. Fair enough. At all. Fair enough. And my yeah. group, I know till 1979, when I went to prison, we had not sold one gram to any uh, member of, the mafia or the Casa Nostra or yeah yeah or whatever you know yeah. that's interesting that's oh. interesting and I suppose and not because of not because we had anything against them sure because yeah we were not approached by it when yeah, I was yeah. approached it wasn't about buying from us when I was approached it was about trading them for heroin that we I didn't yeah, want to yeah. yeah but had been had I been approached most likely I and you know I don't know it's it's a hard call do you because, think that's changed now, George? Do you think, like the, like say, for instance, obviously, the, 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 one of the, the I suppose my, my, my next question was going to be the kind of power change between uh, the, the Colombian cartels in, say, the 70s and 80s, and, and I suppose even 90s, and then it started going into the Mexican cartels and the power shift there. Do you think now this? the Mexican cartels would be dealing with uh, groups like that because obviously cocaine has very much become kind of the fashion drug and, and, and it's been done, I suppose, a lot more and you've had the explosion of crack cocaine in, in, in certain societies in, in the US as well, you know? Yeah, I would imagine that they are for one reason. I mean, I don't know a person because I never knew him, but I know a lot of people that know Okay. Uh, El Chapo is the only man to have distribution in every continent of the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, so uh, was he dealing? But, but, you know, I don't know if the mafia today is what it used to be. No, it's, you know? nah, it doesn't look from seem what to I, from, from the interviews, the YouTube interviews that I have seen of some of the members of the Gambino family and stuff like that, 
Yeah. You know, in the old days, man, people die and not talk. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now everybody talks. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, is it is different like generation? A, you know, the bosses would die without talking from what I hear. I don't have personal knowledge of it. You know, all the bosses talk now. Because yeah. the Rico law, the Rico laws really messed everything up, man. Yeah, yeah, it really. You no, know, it isn't. When you're looking at spend the rest of your life in jail, man. And and the and the thing about it was, I knew that when I went to prison, it was 15 years, and and I and I knew that the people that I was standing up for were going to betray me, but I did it because it was my code. You know, yeah. I didn't want my children to ever turn their back on someone because of something their father did yeah, that, yeah i've lived my whole life in a manner that if, if someone meets someone that they know that they know and one of my kids meets someone that knew me they'll say man your father was loud your father was obnoxious yeah yeah anything in the world but at the end they better say your father was a man of honor a man of principle and honor yeah yeah you know yeah it's important. I think it's a generational thing and I think a lot of that has gone not just in organized crime. I think that's I think that's across the board unfortunately where I think kind of like that 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 kind of an old school attitude it's it's just not there as much anymore, is it? Oh, I listen, I just listened to an interview of this guy that was like the most wanted by the uh, secret service and yeah. he had all those mortgage uh, scams yeah. and he like I ratted everybody out. Um, in my old days, man, to be called a rat was the most yeah. horrific thing a human being can be. Said. I read it on people and myself. Yeah. So if, if you're arrested today and you know that who you, you're standing quiet for, the minute he gets a chance or she gets a chance to turn on you, I don't know what would happen. Yeah, you know? I'm glad I'm glad I'm from the old world, man. Yeah, different times, different times. With, with, with the with the Colombian cartels and the shift in kind of I I I suppose the shift in power where you see like all the Lazetas, Sinaloa cartel, the Gulf cartel in, in, in Mexico, and it seems like that seems to be where the real I suppose they're they're the biggest. Where the Colombians in your time were were the biggest in the narcotics trade. Like, why did that happen? And I suppose a follow up question to that would be: Are the Colombian cartels and the Mexican cartels are they working hand in hand, or are they like rivals? Or what way does that relationship look, George? I think that they're working hand in hand, and and it was an easy it was easy explanation what happened. Okay, I saw it coming. When, yeah. when things became very difficult to smuggle directly to the U.S. I mean, think about it. When I started in 76, we're bringing big old loads right to Miami International Airport. Yeah, yeah. Then we were landing airplanes in my ranch left and right. Yeah. Then they shifted to the islands. Yeah. And then when all that became very difficult, Mexico was the logical point. Why? Because there's thousands of miles of Mexican border. Yeah, yeah. With the yeah. U.S. So for a long time, all Mexico did was transport for the Colombians. Yeah. But like human nature, like everything else, hey, if I'm the one that's making you super rich, because there's only X amount I'm going to get paid for transportation. Yeah. But I can make three times as much if I own the product or if I sell the product. So that's human nature, that transition. And, uh, and the Mexicans are very, very smart. You know, they thinking that when I see uh, the government talk about building a wall to stop drug traffic. I crack up, man. Yeah. I'm like, it's the biggest joke in the world. Now, build a wall to stop human trafficking. I'll yeah. go for that yeah. because that's horrific. But who the hell thinks that massive loads of cocaine are coming across the border by someone jumping a freaking wall? Yeah. Come on, man. Yeah, it's stupid. Listen, we had, they have submarines. Yeah. They have semis with yeah. very, very concealed departments. I mean, we had, we had ways of transporting that you can put a hundred dogs right on top of the cocaine and not smell it. Really? And you can't find it. Yeah, yeah. So now they got more sophisticated. Yeah. You fly at a low altitude and you come from that border in Mexico, you come to all kinds of strips in the US. Yeah, yeah. And then corruption. If you're a border agent, right? And you're yeah. getting paid 50,000, remember something. This was a theory we had. Everybody has a friend, right? And every yeah, friend yeah. has a friend. Yeah. So you're a border agent. I know you are. Yeah. And you're making 50 grand a year. Yeah. And 
one of your best friends is a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. And I go to him, I said, look, tell your friend that I'm going to give him 50000 for doing just this. Yeah. Not, not search that semi very hard. I mean, he's not even going to risk him. He's not carrying the cocaine, touching the cocaine. Yeah, yeah. They can exhaustively search every vehicle that comes it, across the border. Just thousands of vehicles coming in every day in Tijuana and Juarez and all these exactly. places. Exactly. Yeah. So when they say that, I laugh. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah you, you might stop, uh, you know, illegal immigrants, but when a person's hungry enough, he don't give a shit how big your wall is. He's going to climb that wall. Yeah, But yeah. you're not going to Don't use that you stop in drug dealing because the war on drugs is the biggest joke in the world. Yeah, it is. Cocaine, yeah. cocaine is 15% of the, all drug overdose in America, and that's too much. Yeah. But that's what we spend 90% of billions and billions of dollars over a span of 40 years with zero impact, why are we not going after big pharma that's 65% of all the drug overdoses? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So what happened now? We're quarantined. What's open? Drug companies. Yeah. <laughs> Pharmacies. Yeah. yeah. Now they can deliver to your house. Yeah. Purdue so, Pharma. Look, 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 so look so at the big corrupt. Purdue Pharma scandal. Yeah. It's but crazy. pharma has a lot of power. Yeah. As long as it costs a billion dollars to run for president and three, four hundred million to run for Senate. Yeah. Where's that going to come from? Ten dollar donations? Yeah. Give me yeah. a lot, man. Yeah. If yeah. in 1977, 1977, yeah. we were spending a million dollars a month in corruption, how much yeah. do you think the drug cartels are spending now? Yeah. How many politicians do you think are on the payroll? I know, yeah, yeah. So, and it's good. Like, it seems that the, like the actual. Like it seems that the drug situation is getting worse, and they're spending like it, like it hasn't improved. It's getting worse. I, like more people are doing drugs than than back in 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 say your generation. I would have thought because they don't want to stop it. Yeah, See, that's the problem. People think they want to stop it. They don't. The problem is that most Americans don't give a damn because yeah. we're ignorant, right? Yeah. Because we think it's not affecting. And first of all, tell yourself, all that drug money in that drug war is your tax taxpayer dollars. Yeah. That can be used to provide health care for people suffering in America without health care. Yeah, yeah. That can be used to equal the balance where 85% of Americans have less than $400 in savings. Yeah, yeah. When yeah. we have the greatest, greatest unemployment history and the highest stock market. Yeah, yeah. Use your common sense, yeah. right? So they don't want to stop that. It all started with Nixon. Nixon had a right at the beginning. When Nixon declared war on drugs, he went after creating the methadone clinics in New York. Yeah. And Nixon stopped the heroin, uh, heroin trade. When Reagan came ab aboard and said, we're going after the dealers, we started applauding. Yeah. We're like, good deal, man. You're not going to catch us, Yeah, yeah. number one. But just leave our customers alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the problem. Yeah. We have to address the demand. Yeah, one one of the big things that I've kind of noticed, and obviously I'm I'm looking from afar. When you're looking at say, the, 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 in the Pablo Escobar era in in Colombia, it it uh, that that was very similar to what's happening in Mexico now, where there was extreme violence and and, and like the kind of the, the, it was making worldwide news and uh, just just the, the the whole shock of it all. Whereas I think. And I'm just looking from afar, and I might be wrong in this, but looking at, say, Colombia now, it seems that the, the cartels that are operating now have learned a lesson from that, whereas now all of the spotlight is on Mexico. The Colombian cartels, you never really hear anything about them, and they're definitely still there producing Oh, yeah, them oh, yeah. But, like, they seem to have learned a lesson in the fact that, like, they, they're kind of flying under the radar now, you know? Colombians are very, very smart, yeah. And the thing about it was interesting with the Mexican cartels is that the violence, which was different from Pablo, there, yeah. was, a, there was a lot of innocent people died yeah. with Pablo's reign. Yeah. Uh, bombs, I mean, the whole uh, Supreme, I mean, the entire Supreme Court Justice building blown up, airplanes blown up. The Mexican cartels are killing each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That doesn't mean there's not an innocent person here or there. But in reality, 95% of everyone dying from the Mexican cartel wars is them. Yeah. So let them kill themselves. Yeah. Under Pablo, it was different. Pablo was, he wanted to create terror 
in the country. Blowing up airplanes the government and would, stuff, yeah. The go- right, because what drives politicians? Public opinion. Yeah, yeah. Right? So as long as the public is quiet, nobody cares. But when the public, it gets to a point that people couldn't go outside. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, Sorry, you know, I was just going to ask, what's your opinion on what's your opinion on the the whole El Chapo uh, trial? That uh, where like, what was your what was your what was your opinion on that? My opinion was that the Chapo was crazy, man. Yeah, the Chapo. I mean, the thing about it, think about it, and, and this happens with a lot of them. Uh, going back to what I told you, the difference between a businessman and a drug dealer. Yeah. What the hell, Chapo? The most wanted man in the world just finished doing two scapes. Every agency on earth is doing. What the hell is he doing meeting with Sean Penn and Kate Cassidy? Yeah, crazy. Come on, dude. Crazy, crazy. Why are you not in, a, in an airplane to one of those countries that has no extradition? Yeah. You're going to live like a king. You yeah. can have a harem. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I don't think anyone really understood that one. Like, I've heard a lot of people talking about that. And it's just like, what, like, what was he thinking? What was he I think, thinking? And you know what? I, I, at one time, I wrote, I wrote a paper when I was in prison. Yeah, and I called it uh, uh, the excitement of the game, yeah. but the thrill of defeat. Yeah, you know, it's like I don't know if you heard the statistic that they said that six out of ten bank robbers get caught at the scene because they come back to the scene of the bank robber of the robbery. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a uh, I didn't so know that. I say that I think that to a lot of these people, the thrill, the big payoff psychologically yeah. is getting yeah. caught. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, why? Yeah. You know, why Pablo killed those two guys over nothing? Yeah. Why all that greed when you have so much freaking money, man? Yeah. How yeah. did the how did the war start with the Cali cartel? Yeah. The Cali cartel yeah. were the most decent people in the world. Yeah. How did it start? Because the Cali cartel there was another hothead like Pablo. Yeah. And, and Pablo taxed everybody, right? He's fighting yeah. the war. Extradition is going to benefit everyone, right? Yeah. So. so let's say that we all had to pay. Hundred thousand dollars a month. Yeah, you know everybody paid it. So one of them, Pacho Herrera of the Cali Cartel, from what I've been told, was late, or for whatever reason, thought that Pablo should go. I don't know what it was. Anyway. Yeah. So Pablo threatened him. He threatened him back, and then it starts a whole over nothing. Yeah. Like Pablo, why does he have to run for Congress when <clears throat> he's making millions of dollars? Yeah. You know, it's like like these guys in this ep- in this series that's going to come out, Cocaine Cowboys. They worked for me at the beginning. They were dead broke. Yeah, they, they yeah. were selling grams at a discotheque. Yeah. When I was bringing in thousands of kilos, and I gave them a chance, and because one one of my one of them was my best friend. His father was my father's best friend from from birth. Yeah. He uh, I gave him, when I went to prison, and I realized I couldn't run the operation from prison. I handed everything to them, and they became yeah. very powerful. Yeah. So what was the first thing they started to do? They started to become world champion boat racers. Now, everyone knows that it costs a ton of money to run boats. Yeah, so yeah. how does a high school dropout justify the millions of dollars to run these boats that cost millions of dollars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one day I said to the guy, I'm like, what are you doing, man? You're not a freaking celebrity. Yeah, you're a yeah, dealer, man. Yeah. See, that's said, the thing where you're bringing this, people? where people do that and they're driving all the flash cars and whatever. And if you're doing that and you're flaunting that in front of law enforcement, I mean, what do you think's going to happen? You know? Yeah. Hey, look at John Gotti. Perfect example. Yeah, man. yeah, exactly. Look at the old, old time mobsters. Yeah. How did nobody knew them, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Hundred percent. And uh, and and that's that's the, like like the, I I see. I sit back until I decided to come out and start talking. I sit back and I hear all this stuff. And it's like, you know, really? Nobody really knows who the big guys are. Yeah. I give you names that no one even knows. You never yeah. heard of one time. Yeah. And yeah. these people would do circles around Pablo Escobar. Yeah. These people yeah. were multi-millionaire owned uh, coal mines, emerald mines, the biggest construction companies in Colombia when yeah. Pablo Escobar was robbing tombstones. Yeah, yeah. It's mad. It's crazy. Yep. Listen, last two questions because you've been super generous with your time. But one of the questions, uh, and this is kind of a general one, but I, I, I know you've lived a crazy life, George. And I'd be interested to know what's the craziest experience 
that you had in your whole career in the narcotics industry? Okay, so when we decide to, when in 1970, late 78, I get approached by the Bolivian government. Yeah. Right? Where they want, they want to deal directly with me. Yeah. So we're paying eighteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a kilo in Colombia. It was 10000 in Bolivia. And they were willing to give me one on credit versus uh, for, every, for every kilo I bought, they give me one on credit, right? Yeah. So I'm buying it for half the price, but I'm getting twice as much, right? So yeah. literally, instead of making a million, we can make $7 million a month, two, three times a month. Yeah. So I rent the whole deal. I go to Bolivia, meet with them. I take them a million, $500,000. And when we're getting ready to do the load, they say to me that my guy that's down there says, they betrayed you. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, the only cocaine here is the one you bought. Yeah. The one on credit is not here. Yeah. Now I'm 23 years old. If you look at my book, the picture of my book, I look like a nerd, right? <laughs> yeah. I get on an airplane and I go down there and I'm meeting with this general who's overthrown five governments. And I look at him, I said, if you fuck me, I will kill you. Yeah. He looked at me. Now the guy next to me peed in his pants. <laughs> he looked at me and said, you either the craziest SOB I ever met. Yeah. Or you're the dumbest bastard. If you ever say that to me again, I'll kill you. Yeah. Now it was so stupid to say that because you am a 23 year old kid <laughs> in the guy's country where, where he's overthrown presidents and governments <laughs> who did not care about killing anybody. So that was uh, a crazy one. Yeah. yeah Another one was, I get a call, and and this is this is uh, I'll leave you with this thought because this yeah. is interesting I, that I just wrote in my narco mindset journal. Yeah. And uh, because people ask me about mindset, right? And I tell them, hey, I devised this twelve weeks where you can build what I call the ultimate narco mindset. Yeah. The one that has no fear, the one that survived prison, the one that built multi million dollar company. Yeah. So I get a call about three o'clock in the morning from my right hand guy. And this is at a time in Miami that was considered the deadliest city in America, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So he is, so he went to go to his house and when he went to go in about three o'clock in the morning, he hears this rumbling. Huh. He was smart enough not to go inside his house. Yeah. He ran behind his house to another set of houses and, and, and got into somebody's house. Okay. And he called me because these people now, they see that they're chasing them and they're knocking houses down yeah, with yeah, machine yeah. guns, looking yeah. for this guy. <laughs> and he tells me where he's at. And I don't think twice about, I can send people to go get him. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a quarter of a mile from his house. Yeah. You know, I'm a quarter of a kilometer. So I, I had a Bronco at that time. One, one of my vehicles I had was a Bronco because I used to take that to my ranch. Yeah. I get on the Broncos three o'clock in the morning in Miami and I'm driving on the sidewalk yeah. to get to this door. And I'm talking to him on the cell phone to open the door where he gets in my car and we get away. But they shot us 28 times. They shot your car? 28 times. Jesus. When we got off, when we got off, look at the car, it looked like a strainer, <laughs> like a strainer, but we didn't have a scratch. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A scratch. So I tell people why I have no fear because I say that when my day comes, I'm a Christian. So I believe the Bible. The Bible says my days are numbered. Now that don't mean I jump in front of a, a train. <laughs> and if as a Christian, if I live, I live for Christ. And if I die, I'm going to, I believe I'm going to be with him. And if I don't, I lose nothing. Yeah. Uh, I can lose. Yeah. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So my job is not to preach religion or to teach people about, Convert on nothing because the guy that changed my life never asked me to go to church, never asked me to become anything. Yeah. My life is to tell people how the love of a Jewish carpenter transformed my life. Yeah. The most hard of all hearts. Yeah. And then I say, if the shoe fits, wear it. If it doesn't, just guy buy another damn pair of shoes. Yeah, I got you. But <clears throat> why I got the piece I got? Because I try to follow the teachings of this Jewish guy. I mean, people can hate re Christianity, religion, but who the hell has got a problem with a guy that all he did was love the unlovable, man? 
You seem oh. like you're you seem like you're in a lot happier place now in your life, oh. and you seem like you seem like you're like obviously you're a family man, and uh, like obviously uh, like and I was listening, I was looking at something, and there was there was an interview with your wife, and your wife was saying, look, that there was that George Valdez, and I didn't marry him, I married this guy, and this guy is like you seem like you've. You've obviously completely reinvented. Look, you you lived that life. You lived a crazy life, but you're living a completely different life now, and you seem happy. Oh yeah, because I tell people, listen, we'll pay for the choices we make, right? The choices yeah. and consequences. Yeah. But our past does not need to define our future. Sure. We can reinvent ourselves. We can find hope. We can find redemption. Yeah. Look at my wife. When I met my wife, I had decided to become. I have been celibate for seven years. Now yeah. a guy that I could not go to bed and have intercourse unless I was in bed with two or three women. Yeah, yeah. For years. <laughs> when I met my wife and I realized that, she looked at me and she said, I want to tell you something. I'm poor. I was very poor at that time too. My father is a waiter. My mother cleans houses for a living. All I got to give a man is what God's given me. If that's the woman you're looking for, fine. So somehow it worked our relationship. But when we got engaged and we, and we dated for two years, celibate, literally pure. You know what my prayer was for two uh, years? God be my witness. Lord, do you think I can have sex with just one woman? <laughs> can I have sex with this girl who's a virgin yeah. and never experienced anything when all I've been doing is having sex with porn actresses, with, the, <laughs> with crazy women? Yeah. And today I, I have six children. I just turned 64. I just celebrated my youngest daughter uh, graduation. I had all my six kids here, four grandkids, uh, two amazing in-laws, uh, son-in-law and, 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 a, and a daughter-in-law. And I live a good life. Don't get me wrong. You know, yeah. and, uh, but, it, but compared to the life I live, I'm a pauper. <laughs> hey, and you know what? You look good. You, it look, doesn't you, matter. you look fit. It doesn't <laughs> matter, man, because, yeah. you know, I live every day to make a difference in someone's life. Yeah. No one thinks about this. And I, this is how I live my life. When the pages of history are written, will history ever remember your name? Yeah. I don't want history to remember my name because I was this drug dealer or I built a million dollar business. No, I believe that history only remembers the name of those people that impact another life. Good deeds, yeah, yeah. That's why I hurt for yeah. those young African-American, those young Latinos yeah. born in those red. No, I feel you, I feel you. It breaks my heart. Yeah. And one of the missions I do, all the proceeds of my book sales, all the proceeds of everything I do, I buy books to send to prison. Yeah. This year alone, we have sent 20,000 books. Yeah. Every book is read by 10 men, women, or children. Yeah. So over 200,000 people as of today, this year, we've sent hundreds before. Yeah. I've read a story of hope, yeah. a story of redemption. I get hundreds of letters saying how it had changed their life how they found the meaning they were looking for. And that's all I care about. Yeah. So when my day comes, I, don't bother me, man. I didn't think I lived back 25. Hey, I know, I know. I know. 40 years, brother, 40 yeah, years. That's long, good. Way that's... fast, but I thought I lived. <laughs> That's good. Listen, we'll finish on that. Thank you. So I can't thank you enough for coming on. You're a good guy. Really liked talking to you. And look, if you are ever in Ireland, I wasn't joking. If you're ever you in Ireland, some, you owe me some good Irish whiskey. I owe you some good Irish whiskey. And let's 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 do it. Thank you so much and stay safe, George. Okay. And stay in touch. Listen, have people come to my webpage. If they sign on to our community, they get a free copy of my book. And that way they can get an idea. Follow us. Uh, like I said, at the end of the year, there's gonna be a big, big a uh, series of cooking cowboys where they're going to get the whole story. It's going to be, going to be powerful. Looking forward to it. Can't wait to All see right, it. Brother. You're a good Be man. Back. Thanks, George. Thanks, God bless buddy. you. Bye-bye.